that how the graph looks? Not for the circle. Anybody graph the second equation? 2 minus 2 sine theta? Uh oh. Alright, I think that's how it looks. Now the circle's easy. Y1. So I think they're going to look like that. So it looks like there should be three points of intersection. Question is, how do we find them? So we have two equations right here. So how do you solve a system of two equations? It's usually written like this. Elimination is one way. What is another way? Substitution. Substitution. So most people like substitution more. So solve for a variable in one and plug that into the other one. Wow, they're both solved for r. That's really nice. So we'll just set basically the two equal to each other. So I'm going to set 2 sine theta equal to 2 minus 2 sine theta. So add 2 sine theta, we get 4 sine theta equals 2, sine theta equals 2 over 4, which is 1 half. And now we have a regular trig equation to solve for theta. So I'm going to draw it on the unit circle. I want a y value of 1 half. So there's two points on the unit circle that the y value is 1 half. What is the first angle to the first point here? Pi over 6. Pi over 6. I sort of draw, drew it as pi over 4 because I drew more of an oval than a circle. But you should know these are y values. So this is pi over 6. And then the other one will be 5 pi over 6 if you go that way. And I can add as many rotations as I want. And I'll still be at the same place. Plus 2 pi k. Plus 2 pi k. So those are two of the infinite types of solutions. There's another type as well. So these are the two where the radius, or where the angle matches and the radius. The reason we did our graph right here. I can see, if my graph is a little more accurate, these would more accurately be at the angles that I just wrote down. Pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6. There is one more point of intersection, or at least it looks like it, and it should be the origin. Now if you think about the origin, what coordinate has to have what value at the origin? There's an r and a theta. That's exactly right. We need a radius of zero, or else we're not at the origin. If your radius is positive or negative, you're walking away from the origin in some direction. What about the angle? Does it matter what angle we use? Nope. So the origin's a little bit tricky. It could be any angle. It's a little weird. Radius has to be zero, but the angle doesn't matter. That's a good question. So we're going to check the origin separately. So we're going to write checking the origin. So Right down here, we also check the origin. I'll put it in its own little box here. Now, at the origin, the only thing that really matters is your radius is zero. So, we're actually going to intentionally set the radii to be zero and see what we get, see what angles land us at the origin. So, we're setting intentionally r equals zero. Kind of feels like we're doing an intercept 
an x or y axis intercept a little bit because we're intentionally setting a coordinate to be zero. Except in this case, r equals zero corresponds to the origin. We're setting it in both. So zero equals two sine theta and zero equals two minus two sine theta. So the first one, so you can divide by two. So sine of what equals zero? All right, we need another unit circle. All right, where is sine zero in this unit circle? Zero and pi. So we got theta equals zero or theta equals pi. So we're adding the two pi k's here. The other one we can subtract. So we got sine theta equals one and also divided by two. So sine theta equals one. What theta values get you one? And we'll reuse this unit circle. So I need to be up at the top right there. That's where sine is one. Pi over two plus two pi k. All right, so any questions on these solutions right here? So we get lots of solutions. You just have to separately check your origin versus everything else. So that's a little bit strange. So I already told you your quiz is going to be on graphing, which we finished yesterday. So the perfect day for your quiz is Wednesday tomorrow. What's that? Which section? 10.5? 11, 11.5? 11. 11. Right, that's where we just were a second ago. Yeah, 11.5, graphs polar equations. And I wrote down, if you look in the notes, I wrote down what, it's, it's the problems in the book from 11.5 that are graphing which I think is 1 through 20. All right, I'm going to try to write with lines to keep things a little more consistent. And we'll see how that goes. There we go. I try to change things up so that I don't have to keep going to the menu. So we lost the top like half a foot of the screen, so I don't have to go up into the menu anymore. So I get all my pens up there and eraser and all that fun stuff. So complex numbers. Hopefully you remember complex numbers from pre-calculus one. But let's say hypothetically you don't remember them. So let's do a really fast uh, review. And we'll go addition first, and we'll do multiplication second. So complex numbers, we use this big capital bold C, just like capital bold R for real numbers. If you want to write them all out, So it is all A plus BI, where A and B are real numbers. And I squared equals negative 1. So that's how to write them out in set notation. So it looks like number, comma, number plus I. And addition. So 
So A plus BI and C plus DI, you just combine like terms. There's really nothing difficult to addition. You just add the A and the C, the real parts, and you add the imaginary parts, B, I plus DI. You can group them together. That's all there is to addition. It's pretty straightforward. Now I wrote at the top I squared equals negative one. What is a good way to think about regular I? Square root of negative one. So of course you square it, it erases the square root. Now we're gonna look at I cubed. And I cubed, all the algebra you know works with imaginary numbers or complex numbers. So what did I do here? I just split I times I times I into I times I times another I separately. So that's just power rule, not power rule, rule of exponents right there. I squared, we just said was negative one times I. So this is negative I. I cubed is negative I. And now we're going to go I to the fourth power. So I could write this as I squared I squared because 2 plus 2 is 4. Negative 1 times negative 1 is positive 1. So I raised to the fourth power is positive 1. And now we'll look at i to the fifth power. So from the power rules, I can write it as i to the fourth times i. What is i to the fourth? i to the fourth power. Positive one. So this is one i, or just i. So i to the fifth is i. i to the sixth. We're going to do something very similar. i to the fourth, i squared. i to the fourth is one. i squared is negative one. So we get There's another i right there. 4 plus 1. You guys add the powers. So we got 5 of them on the left and then we also have 5 on the right. I just group 4 of them together and one outside. And then we did something really similar for six, group four, the first four together and leave the last two out. And I'm grouping them in fours because I know i to the fourth is one. So I can pretty much forget about i to the fourth because it's just times one. So you can probably see the pattern for i to the sixth, or i to the seventh, i to the eighth, etc. So let's do i to the 23rd, let's get crazy. How many i to the fourths are there in i to the 23? There's five of them. And what's left over? i to the third. So what's happening here? Powers of powers of products. So I took out 20 i's and then had three left. So this is really long division with remainders. Here's the way you want to think about this. Now it's 1 to the 5th power times i cubed, which is negative i. So that is negative i. What you don't want to do is forget parentheses. This looks like the number 1 minus i. So don't forget your parentheses. If you should be multiplying, it better look like multiplication. We'll do one last one. Ooh, negative 37. How many 
i to the fourths, and I'll give you a little hint, there should be a negative exponent up here. So four times what number is close to 37? Four times nine, or negative nine, that's negative 36. And we'll have one i left over. So we have negative 36, oops, there's a negative one left over. So negative 36 plus a negative one is negative 37. So i to the fourth is positive one to the negative ninth, i to the negative one. So how do we deal with i to the negative one? One way to write it is one over i, but I don't think that that's terribly helpful. Wouldn't it be nice to have a positive power? So I'm going to choose to multiply it by one, except the one I'm going to choose is i to the fourth. What is i to the fourth equal to? We said that was one up here. So I'm actually multiplying my Bible positive one. So I'm not changing anything. So I keep writing equals. And now I just add powers. This is i cubed, which is negative i. So that's all fun with imaginary numbers right there. So that was a really brief introduction on powers of i. And now we're going to look at uh, full complex multiplication. So you need to distribute, which is where FOIL comes from. It just says multiply every term in each binomial by the terms in the other binomials. Except I'm going to change the order. You'll see why. We're still multiplying all four terms. We're just going first, last, and then outside, inside. And you're going to see why in a minute. So A plus B I times C plus D I. So I want to multiply first and last. So do that right now. Multiply first times last. So you should have gotten AC plus BDI squared. B-I-D-I, however you want to write it. Multiplication is commutative, so I can move the I to the end, both I's to the end. All right, outside, inside, those are easy, just like before. We have a, I'll go outside first, A-D-I. Whoa, A-D-I plus B-C-I. I'm just changing the order to keep it alphabetical. So it should have been B-I-C but we can change the order of multiplication. So I did some very easy algebra on the AD plus BC terms. That's just factoring I out. What happened to I squared? It became negative 1. So i times i is negative 1, so you actually get ac minus bd. That's the same as plus bdi squared. So this is the weird part right here. So make sure you pay attention to that. Other than that, it's pretty much uh, foiling as usual. You just get that little i squared is negative 1. And that's why I said do first last together, because that's the real part. So that's the real part and the imaginary part you get at the end. So the outside inside are the imaginary parts. So this part turns real. 
All right, that's multiplication. We'll do a practice problem. Oh, I tricked you. I put three of them in there. I only showed you how to multiply two things at a time. So you're going to multiply the first two together, and then when you're done, you're going to multiply that by the last one. So you are going to group up the first two. So do that product first, just like I showed you, and then after you get that product simplified, multiply by i. So that plus three might be the weirdest part of the blue. So what is a plus three? It's really a negative three i squared. But i squared is negative one, so it's actually plus three. So this right here, that three is really negative three i squared. Right there. Which of course is positive three. All right, how do I do this last product right here? Distribute. Yep, just distribute. So you know how to multiply a binomial times a number. So you just distribute, it's pretty easy, just like that. And remember, I squared, still negative one, doesn't change. So you should have gotten i plus 5. Now, it's nice to write the real part first, imaginary part second. So we're just going to write it 5 plus i like that. Now, of course, all these are equal. I probably should have written a bunch of equal signs. All right, so that's multiplication right there. There's not much more to it than that. Division is tricky. We'll do one division example. Oh man, I only showed you how to multiply. How in the world are we going to divide? Almost. If we were adding two fractions, we would do that. Oh, there we go, conjugate. So I don't know how to divide, so I'm going to multiply by the conjugate of the, of the denominator, or of the thing that's doing the dividing. But it's illegal to just multiply by 1 over something that's not 1. So I'm only allowed to multiply by 1. So this version of 1 is what we're going to use right here. So I'm picking the conjugate of the denominator. All right. I haven't talked about conjugates and complex numbers. Let's do that really fast. So these are going to be complex conjugates. A minus BI. A plus BI. So what do I get, or what do I not have to worry about when I multiply conjugates? There's usually a FOIL, four terms coming out. What terms don't exist in conjugate? 
you know, the inside outside term. So I really need to only FL or flow, however you say that. So I don't have outside inside going on. So first one's easy, a squared. Oh, the second one minus bi bi or minus b squared i squared. What does this reduce to? A squared plus b squared. So complex conjugates are a little bit strange. They are number squared or thing squared plus other thing squared, not minus. So that's going to let me multiply the denominator really quickly. 1 squared plus 1 squared. No, I don't really need to square it on them. All right, 1 times 1 is 1. I have really minus i squared, which is plus 1. So conjugates are a little bit strange. They don't multiply to first 1 squared minus second 1 squared. Well, they do, but the minus second one has an i squared in it. So it turns into a plus. Now I have to floy out the top like normal. So at 3 times 1 is 3. Last minus i minus times negative i is plus 1. Nope. Oh, 3 negatives. I'm going to write plus i squared. That one's a little tricky. And now I have minus 3i minus i. So we have 3 plus i squared, which is 2, minus 4i. <clears throat> we can write this as 1 half 2 minus 4i same rules you used before write a division as multiplication by reciprocal and now I can distribute this in just like regular multiplication so we're going to get 1 minus 2i as our final answer So complex numbers have reciprocals. They're just not what you think. Any questions on this one before we move on? This is new, so it should be at least mildly confusing. Hopefully it becomes less confusing the more you do these. All right, reciprocals, 1 over a plus bi. To reciprocate it, I'm going to multiply by the conjugate. Which, of course, you could write like this. So reciprocals are basically the conjugate multiplied by a number. That's how reciprocals work right there. They're quite a bit more involved than the ones in real numbers. Real numbers, you just flip it over. There's not much else going on in real numbers. There's basically no bi in real numbers. So a plus bi is in rectangular coordinates. You can graph it out, go over a, go up b, and that number is a plus bi. So this is written in rectangular coordinates. So this is basically the real axis. This one up here is the imaginary axis. So it's just like a real axis, except it's multiplied by i. So it's called the imaginary axis. So if you want to write this as a point, you just write it a comma b. So go over a, go up b, 
we're just writing it as complex numbers a plus bi so you get your x and your horizontal and your vertical components are a and b the i is really just a placeholder to tell you that that's the vertical component so right now you should be wondering why in the world are we doing complex numbers in trigonometry class what did we just finish and what type of coordinates polar coordinates so we're about to look at complex numbers in polar coordinates so we've been using them in rectangular coordinates before and I showed you how to add them multiply them and now we see how to graph them there's nothing special going on you just have the horizontal part is the real part and the imaginary part is the vertical part I could ask you to graph once easy one plus two i but that's pretty easy to do go over one go up two put a dot right there in fact that's almost where this one is if I went up a little further I could have said that was one plus two i so graphing these in rectangular coordinates is very easy to do what we're going to do instead is look at polar coordinates so we're going to zoom in a tiny bit on this graph so the parts I need are this right here. We're going to call this radius. And the other part I need is an angle theta. So this is going to be mechanically just like points. The only weird thing is multiplication. You can't multiply points normally. You can multiply complex numbers. So we got an A side and a B side. So that side's A, that side's B. So let's write all the relationships we can. It's relatively easy to do. Let's start with how about Pythagorean theorem? A squared plus B squared equals r squared. So if we solve for r, we have squared a squared plus b squared. That's Pythagorean theorem. And we'll go sines and cosines and tangents now. So we have A equals R cos theta, B equals R sine theta. You just divide by R, and that's like the Sogatoa right triangle trigonometry right there. And B over A equals tan theta. So these are straight out of just regular polar coordinates. Nothing special going on. Uh, if you want, you can call that Y and that X, and you got everything in the same exact letters as you had before. So really Z and W are commonly used for complex for complex variables. We use X's and Y's a lot for real variables. We're going to use Z's and W's a lot for complex variables. So first thing is the modulus. or the magnitude. Now we write it like absolute value. So this is how far away is it from the origin? In some sense, it's how big is it? 
but doesn't matter what direction it's pointing, it's going to be the same answer no matter what direction this is going to be away from the origin. So how do we get the distance from the origin? We have it right here. R equals square root A squared plus B squared. So that's how we're going to get this. So we'll do a fast example. So before you, this is going to be modulus or magnitude of 4 minus 3i. I'm going to write down the worst answer you could give me. So it is absolute value, but it's not absolute value of each term individually. So that's very wrong right there. So don't turn negatives to positives. That's not what this operator does. All right, take a minute and tell me the magnitude. And do you see any eyes over here? No eyes. So no eyes better make it into your square root. Or else when you square them, they're going to be negative, and you're going to end up subtracting. I also recommend you don't use negative 3 squared because you might mess up and forget to actually square the negative and you might come out with uh, minus 9 instead of plus 9. So I wouldn't even bother writing in the negative part. You better get a positive number plus another positive number. You should never be getting negatives in there. Alright, any questions on first magnitude? So I talked about conjugates. So let's write the conjugate operator. So it looks like a bar on the top. So that means conjugate. So there's bar on the top. You make the imaginary part change signs. So I could try to trick you. So what is the conjugate of i plus 2? Negative i plus 2. It's probably better to reverse the order, 2 plus i, and then find the conjugate that way. Addition is commutative, so real part first, imaginary part second, and now it's much more obvious, 2 minus i. So this should be a very fast exercise. Compute z, z bar, 
when z equals a plus bi. Make sure you use parentheses when you multiply. The bar sort of acts as parentheses itself. All right, multiply this out. Conjugate first, and then multiply it out. So you should have gotten a squared plus b squared. Now what property, here's our original z, what property is a squared plus b squared of the original uh, z? It's almost the modulus or the magnitude. How does it relate to the modulus? So this is not quite true. We computed z, z bar and said that was a squared plus b squared. So how do I make this equation true? So it's got that stupid square root on it. So it just squared away and it'll disappear. So here's another nice property. Multiply complex number by its conjugate, and you have the modulus or the magnitude squared. So I'm going to convert 2 plus i to polar form. And we're going to graph first. So it's easy to graph. We're in quadrant 1. Go over 2, up 1. And that point is 2 plus i. So we'll get the radius right now. Get the radius first. So your radius is 2 squared plus 1 squared square rooted, so squared 5. Make sure you're not subtracting. If you got square root 3, you probably subtracted. And we're going to look for the angle now. If I complete this triangle, we got 1 there and 2 on the bottom side. How do I relate theta to 1 and 2? Sine, cosine, or tangent. Tangent. Opposite one, adjacent two. Uh oh, I think I picked a bad angle. The best we can write is r tangent, I think. We don't know tangent of one half. I think we know tangent of one, or tangent of theta equals one, tangent of theta equals square root three, or one over square root three, or zero. That's about the only ones we really know. So the best we can do, all right, tan one half. I didn't want to pick one so ugly, but oh well. So 
I have this 2 plus i. And if we write it as x plus yi, x equals r cos theta, and y equals r sine theta. So we're going to r cos theta plus r sine theta times i. So that's turning into polar coordinates right there. So we got rid of our x's and our y's. I just temporarily wrote x and y instead of a and b. It doesn't matter which way you go. And r cos theta and r sine theta will replace them. You can factor the r out. So we get cos theta plus, the i is usually written before the sine theta. So this is our standard polar form. Unlike most of the other standard forms, it's not, well, it's not my favorite form. We're going to look at Euler's form, which is way more useful. But this is a good starting point for polar form.